Hello? <laughs> Can you hear me? Nine. Oh, okay, perfect. That's nice. You must be the people who tweet the word nine to me. Uh, every day for the last three years, I have received at least one tweet that has simply said nine. Uh, so as far as I'm concerned, my, my work is done. Uh, but uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for uh, having me here. Um, I have to say I'm especially uh, grateful that you had me and especially for the advertising publicity work you've been doing because some of my visits have been met with some controversy uh, at times. But <laughs> I know the Republica is, is, is not afraid of a little controversy on, on, on occasion. Um, but I want to also thank Republica for making me a media partner uh, along with a couple of local blogs, I believe. Um, <laughs> I've, heard of, I've heard of the tots. Um, but also, uh, I want to thank my own media partner uh, as well, uh, the uh, Bild Zeitung. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for, for, uh, for that, Axel uh, Springer Verlag. Um, the other thing that's uh, important to me, I wasn't really sure if I was really the right person to speak to you at all. Um, I spend a lot of time on the internet, but I don't know much about the internet. Um, but maybe that makes me not such a bad person uh, to speak to you in some ways. Um, you know what you're talking about, and I'm thinking you might help me explain or understand what it is that I've been doing for the last few years. Um, but I, it was with some hesitation I decided to come. But when I heard that your main speaker couldn't be here. I, um, I, I felt it was my duty to uh, invite my friend Sasha Nobo. Um, <laughs> all joking aside, uh, I want to thank Sasha Lobo personally, myself. Uh, he's the only reason I had ever heard about uh, Republica. Um, and he's also someone who made me interested in the whole topic of the politics of the internet, something I knew very little about. Um, I think many of you remember uh, this article that Sasha wrote a little over a year ago, uh, which I know uh, many found quite disappointing. But as far as I was concerned, that was exactly the way you should feel about the internet right now, is disappointed. There's a great German word for disappointment of Enttäuschung, right? And a Täuschung is a, uh, how would you translate, a delusion of such sorts, right? And the Ent is a removal of something. So you are no longer deluded. This is a good thing. <laughs> Stay disappointed in, in, in your very special German way of being disappointed. Um, <laughs> In any case, uh, it was around this time that Sasha wrote that, um, that much of the NSA news, of course, uh, had broken already. It was still breaking. Uh, one of the more recent events at the time was the revelation that the U.S. Embassy in Berlin was, in fact, one of the main uh, listening posts uh, for uh, uh, American intelligence services, um, which was interesting for me. And uh, it brought about an interesting invitation uh, as well uh, from someone at the State Department, uh, which, which gave me <laughs> a very interesting opportunity to think about this quite personally, about how it is that I position myself vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the NSA, vis-a-vis -vis the US government, etc. cetera. Um, so I did what any true patriot would do after receiving such a request, uh, and I wrote about it in the uh, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. Um, but uh, I did it in all fairness. I was, I was very careful. Oh, you can't read the, the, the close-up. I was very, very careful about the uh, details and quoted quite faithfully, the Germans love you. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, but, for me, <laughs> but for me, it was a very interesting time. It did, it did leave its mark on the paper for, for some time to come. Um, but <laughs> that fame is, of course, fleeting as are most things. Uh, which brings me to 
what it is I'm hoping to talk about, which is uh, a little something called utopia, and how one might get there, uh, and if you'd ever actually want to get there, uh, is, the, is the other question. Um, because for me, I thought I had the perfect answer for you in terms of explaining this, and uh, as, 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 as many of you might have found if you follow my feed, uh, tweets have a tendency to disappear. Uh, they're somewhat ephemeral. So I had to give some thought to this myself recently, and I thought about it, and I kept thinking about it. <laughs> and I became somewhat reflective about my time in this, my time in this city. I started to become reflective about the time of year and about the special, that special thing in the air in spring in Germany. I started to think about life itself. Are there some Stuttgarter in the audience? <laughs> but honestly, I did actually think a bit about my own experience in Europe. I was going to say something about Europe, and I, and I looked back, and I remembered my, 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 my days as a, as a young man visiting the Lorelei of all things, enjoying Europe naively, naively enjoying Europe very casually adopting a German identity <laughs> without any problem whatsoever, <laughs> spending time in the Netherlands, simply riding my bike around, enjoying the local cuisine. <laughs> Things started to change when I made a couple of friends in Berlin. <laughs> Some of you might recognize these two. And of course, there was that fateful trip to Prague. <laughs> You're never quite the same after Prague and reading Kafka. But my own experience of Europe is actually based very much on my time living with a German family. Uh, this was actually just last summer, uh, my, my host mother's birthday. And this was actually, just quite coincidentally, uh, a birthday present was a map of Europe with uh, uh, places marked where they had visited with uh, the no less than three American exchange students they'd hosted. So I don't know uh, who gives out the Bundesverdienstkreuz uh, these days, but I would like to uh, put in a good word for my family in Kassel. But what I'm, <laughs> what I'm here to talk about today is this idea of utopian negation as it relates to Europe. And as it relates to my own little internet project, um, I've tried to define it in one way or another, uh, but I don't know if it ever quite does it justice, as much as to say that um, what I'm interested in is this word nine, saying no to uh, any number of things, but not simply for the sake of saying no to something, um, but saying no to something as a refusal to accept something, uh, and yet at the same time not exactly knowing what it is I might want instead. Um, and that, I think, is very much the position that uh, many of us find ourselves in today, especially dealing with some of the main topics um, that, that have been discussed over the last couple of days at Republica. But there have been early phases of my work in which I wasn't so convinced of this idea. There were even some rather painful periods that are hard to revisit. <laughs> there was even... <laughs> There is even that dandy period uh, for a while, and the Dutch period. Uh, it's, there was, of course, the inevitable drug phase uh, came with a little bit of success. Uh, there was then, of course, uh, the cubist phase, <laughs> the <laughs> I've been ripped off by Microsoft phase. <laughs> there was the radically nihilist phase, and of course there was the, I just sold my book in eight fucking countries face. <laughs> that is one of the strangest images I've, 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 ever, I've ever beheld. Um, <laughs> but let's, let's return to the roots a little bit. Um, 
That avatar is based, of course, as many of you uh, uh, know, on the German-Jewish philosopher Theodor W. Adorno, uh, someone whose work I spent a great deal of time with in my old job uh, as a professor. And I've tried very much to uh, uh, think about how relevant uh, Adorno still is in a very uh, uh, kind of broad sense, and, and his work has taken on its own life and what it is that I do, uh, and in fact has become much more like a, a, a voice that's closer to my own than that of, of, of any particular uh, person, Adorno uh, included. Um, but in what I'm doing, I've tried very hard to think about the ideas that are still very current uh, in Adorno's work, Many of you are, of course, familiar with the notions of negative dialectics or the culture industry. Even if you haven't read uh, Adorno's work, these things have entered the vocabulary in such a way uh, that they're almost unavoidable. So I try, uh, in what I do, to honor, to honor the spirit, to honor the spirit of Adorno's work. I don't like to, in any way, cheapen it. Uh, say by suggesting that Adorno's still alive, living in Chicago and driving a Chevy Malibu convertible. Uh, please note the American flag uh, on, on the left. Um, but I've tried very hard to, to honor Adorno. I would not want to in any way cheapen or commodify uh, uh, the work, the ideas, the thought of such a, uh, a prescient critic of commodification. Uh, nor would I in every way want to betray the legacy of their critique of capitalism, nor would I, nor would I want to violate an aesthetic sense of a thinker who was so, so uh, uh, trenchant in his critique of aesthetics and the connection to, to politics. Um, I also wouldn't want to cheapen the German cultural tradition as a whole. And, and I, and I would not in any way want to reduce some of the greatest masterpieces of European culture, speaking of Europe, to a cheap joke or to a cheap political punchline. Um, and sometimes I feel bad about, about the effect my work has had. I apologize to any museum goers that day. But I know that no matter what it is that I've done, with culture and with Europe, the internet will always go a little bit farther, just a little bit farther than, than I'll go myself. <laughs> so what would Adorno think about this? Uh, the internet itself has an answer, believe it or not, which is disappointing in its way. Uh, I am happy at least to have found a fan or two, primarily in Slovenia, uh, in the philosophical community. Uh, some of you will recognize Joseph Stalin. <laughs> That's not fair. <laughs> it, it kind of is fair. Um, so what, is, what it is that I do, how do I, how do I create some sort of um, uh, haitung or a type of position or attitude that I think somehow enacts uh, this notion of, of utopian negation? And uh, I think to talk about that, it's important to remember a few basic definitions of comedy. This one, uh, ingenious but not my own. Comedy is tragedy plus time. Uh, you probably need no reminder, but of course, Twitter comedy, tragedy plus time minus time. And uh, let there be no mistake, German Twitter comedy, tragedy plus time minus time minus comedy uh, plus fart jokes. Uh, plus or minus Hegel. So, so you can take that home now and do what I do every day, but, but much better. Uh, so the thing that's important about a project like mine is to have realistic goals, um, to know that there really isn't that much you can accomplish by writing a few jokes online. But still, there are ways in which you can address an entire an entire philosophical tradition in a very, in a very precise and, and somehow uh, quite, quite, quite effective way. Um, it's also very helpful in terms of some vocabulary that many might not have gained yet. It's a very good way to impart uh, a greater uh, lexicon 
uh, to those who are learning German as a foreign language. And so I've tried also, of course, to communicate something about a German Lebensgefühl, if you will, a certain just way of life that I think many of us have become quite familiar with uh, in the present. But the other thing that's important, of course, is to think about these terms that have been all around Republika for the last days. Politics. Politik. Realpolitik. Netzpolitik. And I've done my best to explain them, but of course, what is the internet most interested in? The internet is still most interested in everyday culture. but also some more traditional cultural aspects as well. Uh, sometimes you're faced with the task of explaining uh, the German Santa Claus. And <laughs> if, you're, if you're a good boy and you reveal all the secrets we're not supposed to have, you'll be visited in Moscow. So it's a lovely tradition. And I, I, I do my best, I do my best to, to explain that uh, as much as I can. But also, I don't limit myself to Germany. I mean, I'm interested in Europe. That's what we're talking about, the kind of Europe that's been created uh, in this particular format, in this particular way, and, and an effort really to, to address many common misperceptions about politics or about uh, any number of, of aspects that are related to <laughs> That one just walked by too fast, Roland walking into a bar. Um, but also it's important for me to contextualize European news for, for the broader world as well. You're really not sure what to make of these things if you don't have a somewhat larger context. Um, so I've tried also to keep up in many ways with Germany's, in particular, many attempts at multiculturalism and uh, multilingualism. You will remember this, this, this issue of the Bild Zeitung. Um, but I also do try to get to the root of some of the, some of the key problems uh, facing the continent today, um, and especially to address questions of lawmaking and legal tradition, as well as, of course, scientific discovery and innovation that's become so important to Europe. Um, and of course, also very important to address some of Europe's finest traditions. Uh, and I do the best, the best I can to do that without, without shortchanging Europe, Europeans with some explanation of the world that I know uh, in the United States. And so I try there as well to address any number of aspects that must be quite confusing uh, to Europeans uh, about the United States and our political culture, uh, for one thing. Um, and I also try to address current controversies, revelations, uh, 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 with a nice Rammstein reference for the kids. I think I misspelled Rammstein. <laughs> um, but the other thing that's important, of course, is to address tensions that are with us right now. If, if there's... Do we have drones in the audience? Uh, the, um, but trying to, to, to address uh, what I would consider defining tensions um, in being so foolish as to take on uh, the task of, of uh, giving my, myself the topic of the, of the uh, entire Republica, I found rather quickly that this question of, of finding Europe is really very little, has very little to do with finding Europe and has much more to do with inventing a Europe or fighting for a certain type of Europe that you want. Um, and there's a type of Europe that I want you to have. Um, and that, that's why it's very important for me to think about the discussions that are taking place here and will continue to take place and hopefully also the action that comes out of uh, an event like this. So the other thing that of course is important is to give some idea of the scope of current, uh, current events, current uh, struggles, current problems within a global context, um, but also uh, in making the jump uh, into print that I've done somewhat recently, also to address 
some of these questions of uh, U.S.-German relations, but also uh, uh, tensions within Europe uh, itself in terms of economic uh, problems, economic troubles. Uh, I've certainly addressed the question too very recently of migration, immigration, uh, uh, asylum, etc., cetera, um, and tried also in a way to speak to to problems that are by no means European alone, um, but in fact uh, are, are very much world problems, although they're often not quite seen that way in the United States. Um, and so certainly most recently, I've had much more to do with questions of... <laughs> I think that's the only one of those I've ever liked. I kind of liked that one only because I could use that title. Uh, that, that, that I enjoyed. Um, but I know that there are a lot of ideas out there about defining Europe. This is from Burley Monster, who also uh, created our friend uh, Sasha Nobo, um, but who's been helping to channel Habermas in many ways about what kind of a Europe could come about, how it might come about, and what kind of struggle is involved. Um, so I've tried myself to think a bit about how I might define Europe, and I've thought of it in terms of aesthetics, I've thought about it in terms of economics and, and economics and technology as much as I can. But of course also talk, thought about it as well in terms of, of questions of international relations um, and, and broader networks of, of, of power. Um, but also very much, again, defining tensions internationally but also within, within Europe itself. Um, and again, within a larger intellectual framework as well, has been, been important in terms of positioning whatever it is that Europe is now and is on its way to becoming. So what is it that I have to show for this? Um, there's no mass movement uh, that's, that's going to come about overnight by any means. Uh, very little influence in politics in the United States, uh, I'm, I'm sad to report. Um, also, very little impact uh, in Europe itself, um, although, although there have been some, some efforts made on occasion. Um, but there have been small rewards along the way, small moments of, of recognition, of shaping, shaping the youth uh, of the United States, for instance. This is my, uh, my nephew who uh, will be paying uh, some, some rather intense uh, uh, therapist bills in the future. <laughs> but every now and then, even out of the blue, a message in a bottle shows up on paper uh, from Europe, uh, which, which to me have been these moments that I consider quasi-utopian uh, along the way, a very everyday stinknormale utopias of some sort. So I want to leave a fair amount of time for, for conversation, but I'll end at least with, with, with a couple of words. Um, there's a lot of sense that I've gotten, or at least that's been uh, reported recently, about people's sense of frustration in dealing with the politics of the internet. Um, and certainly, I think this is something that you should not necessarily shy away from, but embrace. This is something that I find many of you are probably uniquely qualified to deal with, uh, a European culture that really should not become any more American when it comes to dealing with disappointment and bitterness and, and regret, you've been trained in many ways to live with this disappointment in a way that I think would be quite productive for all of us. Um, and I'm hoping that in many ways you'll take the opportunity of being disappointed to hope again in some rather different way, but a type of hope that I think uh, you'll find in many ways there is a discussion that's happening all over the place now on Twitter, on the internet, which in fact takes aspects such as uh, recent blocking of, of Twitter, Google, etc. cetera, in, in Turkey. It's becoming an opportunity for a very lively discussion online. Uh, there are also very good signs too in terms of European connections that are being made that we might not have expected. Did the bikers ever arrive? Uh, that story kind of died before I, before I found out if, if, if they made it here. But there are other small steps that you yourself can make 
in terms of dealing with some of these, these problems. So I don't want you to feel helpless. There are definitely things that can be done, but for now, I'll simply wish you the very nicest Wochenuntergang I can. Thank you for your attention and look forward to your questions. So thank you very much. So are there any questions? Please raise your hands and I come along. <laughs> Don't make me ask myself a question. <laughs> no. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Hello? Um, so, in your uh, tweets, you often play with the German language. Do you think it's uh, easier for you because you are not a German native speaker? Uh, what was the so first part? I actually just didn't hear. See, you're, you're playing with the German language a lot in your tweets. And uh, do you think that it is easier for you be because you are, have a certain distance to the German language because it's not your uh, native language? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, it's, it's uh, kind of interesting because in my old job as, in fact, a German professor, uh, I was never quite good enough with the language. I started very late, uh, I have an accent, I make grammar errors, all of these things. And I always felt extremely insecure about that. But in fact, what it is, with, for what it is that I'm doing now, it can be an advantage to have a distance from the language. You recognize things that you would not if the language were that natural to you. So, so yes, uh, I do. The, uh, uh, it does lead to some very bad puns, however, that uh, one might have better judgment about if one were a native speaker of the language. Are there any more questions, please? Oh, yeah, that's not clear. Moment mal. Ganz hinten, da kommt keine Kamera hin, obwohl wir haben ja sowas. Bitte schön. I'm sorry for sitting in the back. Um, I had a lot of fun in your talk, but I didn't quite get the message you wanted to get across. <laughs> do, do you want to hear it again? <laughs> yeah, uh, in 140 characters, please. That I would probably be better at doing than in, uh, than in summarizing here. Well, this is the, the thing. Um, the message that I've had is really one uh, of, of, of uh, a type of encouragement, I suppose, um, in that what I've seen, and I could really only talk about the internet or talk about Europe from this tiny little perspective of one particular project that I've been uh, involved in. But what I've seen, and I wasn't someone who spent much time online at all in the past before this, um, but what I have seen is the potential for a certain type of uh, community to come about that uh, I've seen done some very uh, uh, generous and very interesting and, and very uh, innovative things um, as a result of people liking a stupid Hegel joke, uh, people liking a, a, a bad pun. And that to me has been really interesting um, because I think primarily uh, what, I've, what I've found is that there are people who have come together, there's a type of community that's formed that would not have uh, if essentially there wasn't the fun, there wasn't the kind of, of playful aspect of, of what it is that I'm doing. Um, and I'd say what I've tried to do at least is give you some taste of what that looks like, right? Uh, but also to ask you in a way to consider if that isn't maybe uh, uh, an important element to, to keep in mind in terms of facing the kind of struggles that you're facing right now. Um, the, the message that I've been getting, uh, both from, from what I've seen of, of Republica last year uh, on the live stream and what I've seen this time around as well, is that uh, these are extremely difficult issues in terms of uh, questions of, of uh, net neutrality, which I think is a terrible term, uh, but extremely important issue. Um, certainly the questions of surveillance, um, but also uh, uh, these questions as well that have very little to do with, with, with governments per se and much more to do with uh, private industry and what, what, a, what a company knows about you, how, they're, how uh, in fact the data that is, that is collected can have uh, an extremely significant aspect, uh, 
extremely significant uh, impact on, on your life in a way that we might be more used to thinking about uh, within the context of the state. Um, but actually, uh, what, what I think is one of the main issues right now, uh, in the United States at least, is very much that question of conglomeration of data within a, a commercial context. So for me, um, primarily the, the, the point that, that I've had, if any, is that of this is a long struggle. It's going to take a, a lot of energy and for a long time and a lot of organizing. And while these are serious issues, you need to keep in mind as well, what is it that can keep you going? What is it also that can speak to an audience of people who doesn't necessarily have the same investment in some of these issues? They might have that investment. The internet might be just as important to them but they don't know it, right? Um, and to me, the, the project that I've had on, online has been mar largely one of translating what I consider important issues into a language that works on Twitter or that works for a, an audience that isn't necessarily already interested in these topics. Um, and so if anything, uh, the message is that of don't forget how to communicate uh, some of these issues and how to connect uh, with people about, about uh, issues that matter and that you'll have to fight for for some time. But um, that's, that's, that's not inspiring. I mean, that's just, that's just the way it is. I mean, you know that these, uh, I mean, from what I've gathered in the talks I've gone to so far, uh, we're not talking about a very sexy struggle when you're dealing with EU politics. Um, these are things that are grueling and, and extremely uh, detailed from what I gather. And these are things that are also hard to communicate. Um, and so some of the things that I've seen online be very effective um, have been when things like Netspolitik have used more humor in a lot of the message that they're, that they're communicating. Uh, you can question how, what kind of an impact does that have, how effective is it, but I do think that that's significant in terms of that initial connection with someone that, uh, in fact, maybe there is something uh, that's at stake for me as well in these issues that, well, the computer internet expert seem, seem to know something about. So, other question? Okay, one more question. No, I think. Oh, no, moment. Yeah, yeah. Der bärtige Herr. Thank you, sir. I'd like you to. Um, yes. I can give I'd like you to it. ask how much uh, your career in the academia influenced your nihilistic perspective and somehow how. Uh, uh, you decided to go from a very close environment towards a, 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 a wider uh, um, yes, perspective like that one provided by, by the net. Actually. Uh, how did I decide to, to, to make that step? Yes, I was asking how much your academic experience influenced your nihilistic perspective. Um, I would say for me, this step wasn't very hard because I didn't have a choice. Um, I, I was failing at, at what it is that I was doing, which was uh, I couldn't find a language within uh, my academic work that meant anything to me anymore. I actually had a, a difficulty in trying to write academic prose in that I found that I was just rehearsing the same cliches time after time. Uh, and so what it is that appealed to me is, in fact, that language is still present for me somehow, right? But what I'm mainly interested in doing and these things that, yes, they're dumb, they're dumb little jokes, but they're trying to work with the language that's out there um, that, that I can work with in a very different way and that I think is, in, is trying to recontextualize uh, philosophical ideas, but also trying to recontextualize some language that you might know within the context of politics or marketing or whatever it happens to be, uh, to do something different with, to have a different form of recognition um, of, in fact, these, these ways of thought uh, and structures of power that are with us every day, uh, although they're not terribly uh, um, uh, uh, obvious to us at, at, at all times. So I would say it's always there, and what it is that I like about doing what I'm doing is, in fact, the opportunity to take that apart and do something else with it. So one more question. No. Oh, yeah, yeah over here. So, um, hello? Yeah. So um, the struggles on things like net neutrality um, 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 are partly um, a war on words. So. Um, uh, I think um, Newspeak is a thing who plays a, a big role in this. So it's a, it's a war that government and the people uh, fight about words or 
des descriptions. Um, can you help invent new words? Uh, I I'd be happy to help. I mean, this is a conversation I've had with people here the last couple of days, is what other, what other words are out there for uh, Vorratsdatenspeicherung, right? And I've, that is challenging. Right? I mean, I think it's extremely difficult. And um, I've learned about some interesting resources that are out there where that attempt is being made. I don't think there's an easy answer to that, but I actually think that's quite crucial. I mean, it might sound like a really surface kind of uh, marketing uh, uh, PR kind of question, but I think it's actually central to, to organizing broader support for any number of these issues. Um, I think it's very hard to get behind a concept of neutrality. I mean, that is not, a, that is not something you imagine a, a glorious struggle behind the, the notion of neutrality, no matter what it happens to be, but the associations with that, for instance. Um, so I think that's a key problem, and, and I don't have any easy answers for that. I mean, you see that for me, it's been about trying to somehow take those terms and do something with them, recontextualize them somehow, but um, reinventing them and establishing them is a whole other task. I mean, a difficult one, but I think it's one that has to be taken on. No question about it. We have another question, and here hinten, in the second row. Yeah. Hello. Um, in some of the tweets, you're quite critical about Europe as well. So um, maybe you can just say one or two sentences about your perspective on Europe and maybe how we can find Europe, as the slogan is. Yeah, uh, I guess for me, it's a question of, of... It's not a matter of finding anything. I mean, it's very much a question of, of creating, inventing uh, the Europe that you're going to have, want to have. I mean, it's a struggle. I mean, it's interesting. It just um, uh, yesterday in, uh, I guess it was the New York Times, uh, this was about Germany in particular, but a question about um, an opinion column, Tom Friedman, about, um, well, Germany is doing so many things right, but it has to finally become serious as a global player, uh, which essentially means uh, um, coming to terms with its, uh, uh, with its global power, and especially in terms of the military, etc., cetera, um, uh, this antiquated pacifism, et cetera, et cetera. These discussions are taking place, I mean, at all different levels. Um, but I think that it's, it's primarily... Uh, what I've been noticing over the last days is that these questions about um, the very specific issues uh, in the, I don't know if you use the term, internet community um, are in fact, seems to be more and more European issues. I mean, from some of the talks that I've heard, um, we're talking about policies that are coming from Brussels within the context of the EU. This actually means some sort of investment, re-engaged, uh, reinvigorated investment in whatever that EU project is, um, despite the fact that, again, speaking problems of language, um, uh, that's very, very tricky. I mean, my sense is that it's very hard for people to in engage with a number of these, these issues in EU policy that are central to their lives, but seem so very far removed. And to me, I think that the, much of the work of organizing for creating the kind of Europe that you want uh, is going to be uh, focused on uh, finding a way to translate um, the complexities that these things take on uh, within that context into, into, uh, uh, a, into a language that people can understand and understand what's at stake. Um, I, would, I would think that's probably the main legacy of my time in academia is, in fact, that was always the question. I might be writing a paper about, about, about uh, uh, a play from the 18th century that very few people know, and yet you had to identify what is at stake in that. Why does it matter to read that? Uh, what is the argument you're going to make about that? And how can you actually make the case that this is worth paying attention to? Um, if anything, that is the world that I'm coming from and the challenge that I found in it. And I think that translates into any number of the issues that people have been talking about here for the last couple of days. Um, so that's a very broad answer, but that's, that's the level at which I'm operating on in, in terms of those questions right now. Okay, thanks. Eric, thank you very much. Your applause, please. Thanks. Thank you.